I'd like to welcome everyone to the fourth in our series, our build, Building Our Power in AI. Uh, thank you so much to Anna Roisman of Testmaster Academy for championing this webinar series together with us at IVAO and also Aprajita Mathur of Garden Health, who has led in uh, the design and uh, knowledge learning around all of these webinars. So we welcome you. Uh, we wanted to just take a moment to uh, thank you for joining us from all over the world. Uh, we know about 52 people had reserved spots and we understand you know, that you might uh, trickle in at different times. Uh, I just want to take a moment to ask everyone how they're doing and also to thank the first responders and healthcare providers around the world who are at the front lines of keeping us safe and secure. I'm in the Washington DC region. Uh, my name is Devar Ardalan from IVAL. And um, I just wanted maybe everyone to, uh, as I bring up the slides, to just tell us where you're joining us from in terms of the panelists, and then we can get started. Uh, I'll, AP, I'll throw it to you. Hi guys, I'm in the Bay Area. I'm working from home for the last two weeks. Uh, pretty interesting circumstances. Um, would encourage everyone to stay safe in a way uh, and take care. Yes, um, how about Jennifer? I'm Jennifer Bonin. Um, I am working out of Minnesota and am the CEO of Pink Lion AI. So hoping everyone's doing well. For us, we're not shelter in place yet, but we anticipate it's coming. Um, so we're just practicing social distancing in Minnesota right now. Great, and Katya? Hello, yeah, so I'm Katya. I am in the UK. I live in York and work in Leeds. And um, we have just today entered the full lockdown. So we are still adjusting to the situation and trying to find our feet in it. Yes. And Anna um, is uh, in New York City. Um, she might not be able to connect. There's been some connectivity issues, but we thank her uh, again. So we're just gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to, I, I gave a brief introduction around the Building Our Power in AI series. I know participants are joining now. Um, I'd like to ask every uh, panelist to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit more about your work. We're gonna start with AP, and uh, maybe also just give us a brief uh, summary of what you're going to talk about today in your section. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Prajita Mathur. I also go by AP. I'm a mother of a three and a half year old, and I work at Garden Health. Uh, Garden Health builds a leading provider for um, liquid biopsies, which are basically used for cancer detection in advanced stage cancer patients, also used now getting into early stage cancer detection. And the cancer detection is done through blood. Um, I'm an engineer by training and have been working in the field of bioinformatics and software testing for the last 15 something years. Jennifer. Um, Jennifer Bonin, I am the CEO of Pink Lion AI. We are a platform, so think of us as the app store for AI, where we evaluate different technologies that are out there in the market space that could fit um, for different businesses and organizations to solve their challenges they're facing today. Right now, where that's applicable is a lot of the gig economy markets, the gaming companies are seeing higher demand and volume than normal. So we're assisting them in dramatically shifting strategies to adapt to this new world we all live in. Thank you. Katya? Hello. Yeah, so I am a test engineer or software engineer and test or tester. People call me different names. Um, I have been working in the software engineer for quite a while now. I currently work with Infinity Works, which is a consultancy and we specialize in cloud development generally. So we have bigger companies move their monolithic appliances into smaller microservice structures and host them in the cloud. We also work a lot with the NHS Digital, which is the health service provider over here. And in that capacity, we have them a lot with um, big data and some machine learning applications. Wonderful. Um, great. And so we're going to have AP go ahead and begin. 
So I will be giving a very brief introduction about AI and ML uh, before we head into testing aspects of AI and ML um, by Jennifer and Katja. Uh, so next slide, please, Laura. Okay, so we've talked about AI, it's a buzzword, everyone's talking about it. And if you ask people, what's the best AI out there in the world? Everyone's gonna give you a different answer. People might come up with different, uh, you know, aspects of technologies that are out there actually. For me, uh, best AI out there is really the human brain. So next slide, please, Thor. It's really all of us. Um, there's no AI system out there that has beaten or even equivalent to human brain right now. It is um, the best AI that's there. So what is AI really? And what are we really talking about here today? This is a, uh, so AI is, this is from Wikipedia. It's um, sometimes also called machine learning. Uh, and there are different things that people call it. They might call it neural intelligence. You might hear the word neural networks, but all AI is really, uh, it's uh, demonstrating intelligence by machines. Um, and uh, experts generally categorize AI into three broad categories. Um, next slide, please. The first one is artificial narrow intelligence, which is focused on one single narrow task and it possesses narrow range of abilities. So the second one is artificial general intelligence, which is similar to humans. And the third is artificial super intelligence or smarter than humans. So if we were to say, where are we today? These are some examples of AI systems that you would see every single day. Their cars are full of AI systems. We have Google search, which all of us use. I use it a lot. We have email spam filters. Your phone has it. So uh, just recently I realized on my iPhone now, it sorts my messages into two categories. If I have a contact saved, it's separated from people I don't know. So that's a filtering system which is using some sort of um, machine learning technique. But where are we really? Or do we have like a machine out there which is like the Terminator, right? You know, super powerful, knows everything, can control the world kind of a thing? Not really, this is just a movie. So where are we really today? We are in the very first box, which is called artificial narrow intelligence. And what that means is that the artificial intelligence we have today is really focused on single and narrow tasks. Um, and what does that mean? What do, what do I mean by single narrow tasks? So let's see. So if we were to, the use of computers have become extensive for humans for a lot of reasons. Uh, for computers, some, uh, some things are very simple for computers to do versus humans. So for example, if I was, if you asked me what is the square root of the number 4802938, it's probably going to take me a very long time to calculate that by myself without a calculator. But if you were to use a calculator, you were to use a computer to do it, it's going to do it in like million seconds, right? Or even smaller unit than that. However, there are tasks out there which are very simple for humans, but they're very difficult for machines. So this is actually a book which my toddler is loves. And it's like my big animal book. He recognizes all of these animals pretty well. He recognizes them in different shapes and forms. And if I was to write a machine learning algorithm to identify animals, it's going to be very difficult. So what does that mean? That gives us perspective that ANI or the narrow intelligence task, which we say they're pretty simple for machines, taking something that is simple for humans and converting it into an artificial intelligence or converting it into machine learning algorithm is very, very complex. And that is where we are right now. So for example, birds, right? So if I was to show this to my son, he will probably be able to recognize different species of birds. He's, he's really into animals. But uh, if I was to give this to a machine learning algorithm, depending on how that machine, le machine learning algorithm was developed, it may or may not be able to categorize this. So we don't really think about how awesome our brain is and how well uh, connected some of our systems are um, and we are able to do these things pretty simply but not so much for uh, 
a machine. Next, please, Davar. So how do we really do it? So for us, it's all in our brain. We have cells. The human brain, uh, you know, has cells which are called neurons, and they uh, have memories, and they communicate using uh, signals. And this was described long ago. Most machine learning algorithms, or what you hear as neural networks, is actually a way of reproducing what we think our brain cells actually do. Um, next, please. And the first concept of neural networks was introduced in 1943. So it's not something that's new. It's been there for a while. But why, are we why, are, why is this picking up so much speed now? Well, we haven't really had technology to support some of these uh, activities so far. And so it's picking up speed now. Next one. And so what are all the type of networks that are possible? What are the different type of networks that you would see out in the world? So the one that I talked about, the first one is called supervised classification, which is basically show and tell. So you see something and you tell what it is, um, like face recognition. They're unsupervised, which means that you don't really know what's happening, but you're trying to find a pattern in something. So something like, you know, theft systems. So when you get an email from your bank that says, hey, you spend too much money, is this really you? They're really trying to find uh, anomalies in your regular stuff, right? Uh, the third is reinforced or predictive analysis, which is basically correlation between past and present, and which is something like, you know, your Apple Watch, which is trying to keep track of your heartbeat. Next, please. We can skip this. It's just a definition of machine learning. You can look it up in Wikipedia. Okay, so really quickly, this is a very simple example of a neural network and what it really does. So imagine you have a letter, you have the number one. For us, it's pretty easy to recognize this. And happen is you would say, okay, we are trying to find the output. We want a machine to identify this as one, and we are trying to get to the best possible output, not the correct output, the best possible outcome. And so imagine you have zero to nine digits. The, you know, this is a neural network. We're just trying to predict what it does. And then in the output section, it predicts different values. The target is one. And so if you see, we say, well, it didn't really get there. We calculate a loss and we say, okay, ha there's some differences from the actual outcome. And what you're trying to do in neural networks really is trying to reduce this loss. You're trying to reduce the gap from a good prediction to what the machine actually predicted. So you're trying to minimize that. Next slide. How do you really do that? So if you just give an outcome and it's not the best one, how does the machine really learn? Where does the learning come in place? So this is back propagation, which is a very common term in machine learning. And what that really means is every time you give, in the out, give inputs to the system, it learns. And at the end, when it re realizes that it is not the best possible outcome, it translates it back. So as you see, it from output layer number three goes back to your neural networks. And now it's just learning itself the things that it did wrong or the things that it can correct so that it can reduce the error. Next slide. There are many, many type of neural networks. The one that I demonstrated was like one of the simplest ones. Um, and there's a website out there. You guys can go um, actually check this out. It's pretty cool. Um, next one. And there's another website which is called playgroundtensorflow.org. It's a pretty cool website. What it allows you to do is actually create some of these neural networks and train your neural network to classify or to do other things. Like in this specific screenshot, if you can see, I've, I have a two neuron neural network. I'm trying to train it. It does have bad prop propagation, so it's learning by its mistakes, and then it's trying to classify different data points. Um, and you don't have to code here. You can just go here, try different things, and basically play with it. And this would give you a good idea of how these things are developed so you can test them better. Great. And that's it. Yeah. So I know um, that there was one question. So I'm going to go to that question. Um, uh, so AP, do you think you could click on the Q&A? I'm not able to bring it up since I'm sharing my screen. 
Yes, so the question is how to figure out the test data. I think we should answer that at the end of the okay. uh, webinar, Devar. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the question, we'll come to it. Thank you so much. Uh, great, and so we're going to go next to Jennifer and Katya. So Jennifer, take it away. Perfect. So what I want to talk about is looking at um, what are the opportunities now that we understand what AI is from AP, where can we apply that in our everyday life and what are the use cases where companies are actually seeing it being leveraged and used inside organizations? So if you go to the first one, um, our mission, what we look at is bringing AI out to teams because the real application of this is how does it impact all of us? If you follow some of the futurists, there's one named Ben Pring, and he has a book out called um, What Do We Do When Machines Do Everything? And the thing to think about for all of us in our day-to-day -day lives is at some point, every industry, every person, every job will have a component of AI in its world. So the way the futurists look at it is they say X is our job, if this was a formula, and you add AI to it, and we have all of us interacting and engaging every day in our jobs, leveraging artificial intelligence and some form of machine learning. We do it today with our phones, with our apps that we use. We're a part of it, but at some point it'll become a part of your job. So for us as testers, if we go to the next one, as testers, where does that apply? And that's where we have to look at is what are the things that is going to impact us directly so one of the things we look at is there's many places where it's going to be leveraged and used in organizations. But what I would say it does is it shifts slightly what all of us in the testing space as we use more and more AI need in terms of the skill sets we're leveraging. So AI brings a lot of data. So there's a lot of the data that comes out of AI driven systems. So data analytics and data science is huge. So understanding the correlations of data, how data works together, and putting that together in information that's digestible by executives and leaders is really critical for people in the QA space. So that first part, the head of the lion, looking at dashboards. Dashboards is going to be a huge piece around how do we visualize data in our organizations and get information out to make tangible decisions that executives need to make on how to drive products forward and services in our organization. The next piece that we'll see is visual diffing. That's one of the first places you've seen a lot of companies starting to embrace and engage in AI is around visual verifications where instead of having a human look at two samples of information, you use artificial intelligence to identify the differences between the samples that it's looking at. So to AP's example, if we're looking at animals or birds, if one doesn't look exactly like what we thought or we need to identify, it'll kick that out so the human can take a look at it and use the human brain to identify if that's a correct sample or not in that situation. What I think we'll also see is looking at where does AI play? So we talk about AI first strategies in testing, not that that's the only thing you do. We've heard in our industry many times over, each time we get a new technology, you'll hear people say, well, this will do everything. We heard automation would do everything. That's not the case. We're years and years into automation. So AI will do some things and it does some things really well. And I think over the next, you know, year, six months, year, two years, we'll see even more advancements in that space. But you have to look at what does it do today and what are the pieces it can do inside your organization. And then the other consideration is that on and off-prem solution. So what you have to look at in your organization, is it important that I own and have the data and it's running on-prem versus off-prem in my organization? Yes. <laughs> The joys of working from home right now. We have small <laughs> friends. <laughs> so um, you have to decide if I need to keep my data on-prem if I work in a secure organization or industry, or if you're okay with something being in the cloud. That's a consideration you're all going to have to make as you're evaluating solutions. The next piece we're seeing huge um, uh, involvement in is sentiment analysis, 
where AI can go across multi-platforms where people give you reviews and identify if you are having um, features or functions that people really like or if there's things that they want changed or altered. So as testing shifts to make sure that we're serving the needs of the customer versus just finding defects and issues in, in systems, sentiment analysis becomes really critical for all of us to understand what do people think about the features and functions being built and what are the most critical things to test. Next slide. So here's what I would tell you is, you know, look at problem statement first. So identify if you're looking at AI in your organizations on what to test and how to test it. I would start with answering some of the other questions that we just talked about, about do I want on or off prem? Um, do I, where do I want that data stored? What am I going to do with it? How am I going to visualize it for people? But then once I understand my problem statement, you can look at the best space to start and try this out. There's a lot of different providers in the space and it gets confusing. So you need to first look at what's my problem statement? What do I really want to solve? And some of those things could be, I know I have challenges with mobile test automation. It's hard for me today to keep up with all of the changes, the builds, the iterations. So if I had something that could scale and could provide mobile test automation solutions, that is one space. There are several providers in that space today that offer solutions where if you implement them, it doesn't mean you have to be able to use TensorFlow and be able to code. A lot of the AI solutions today have interfaces that folks who have very strong skill sets in manual testing, skill sets in traditional test automation can leverage to do the things they need to do. So we'll see a bridging of some of the skills, I think, as we bring in this AI of people who have been great manual testers who understand business processes, who understand business flow, are able to use these technologies. The other thing is web test automation. So if you have websites that you have to automate and check and verify, that's another place where AI is being leveraged today. We see that in a lot of organizations and companies where they have to verify multiple operating systems, um, multiple devices, multiple types of form factors that they're looking at, um, high amount of change and degree of change on their sites. That's a good place to look and say, does AI fit for me in this space? Another piece is stream quality. Right now there's companies um, that obviously do streaming, which are highly popular right now with a lot of us working remotely and from home, where they want to test for janky frames, other types of things in streaming. That's a space where you could look at AI to help evaluate the quality of the stream. Traditionally, you've had to have humans sit and watch all of those streams, but now what you can do is leverage AI to do some of that heavy lifting. I always say use AI to be your virtual research assistant, where it does a lot of that heavy lifting but you still require the humans to evaluate, understand, and test the results that you're getting from that AI. Performance testing from the user perspective can be done leveraging artificial intelligence today. So we know that there's a value in seeing what the consumer sees. I think we've all seen it as testers where you'll say, I'm sensing that there's a problem here. It's slower to log in than it used to be. AI can automatically check for login and timings, um, give you CPU utilization, memory utilization. Those are things then that you don't have to do yourselves. We mentioned the visual diffing. That's a very popular one for people. So humans don't have to go in and identify if there was a fractional pixel change or movement in the system. You're able to actually do that using AI. Things that the eye, as we see it, doesn't always identify the change. AI is very consistent in doing that. It can also do a lot around document compare and then getting that sentiment analysis we talked about. So I think the key is if I were to say how to go about once you understand what AI is looking at where it can be applied in your testing that you're doing today is first identify where do I have a pain point? Where do I have a heavy lift where I have to do a lot of rote routine things, clicking of the same buttons, where if I could create a virtual research assistant who could click those buttons, identify and check those things, then I as the human have more time to free up to do the higher value add tasks, some of the critical thinking skills, some of the higher order of magnitude items in the business, more impactful things. 
then that frees up you to have time to focus on those items and those things. So I think in, in the time that we look at and the time we have here, just in this short amount of time, my advice would be look at areas where you could use a virtual research assistant. And then once you know that, pick an area that you wanna try and experiment with things. There's a lot of different technologies out there. As testers, we like things to be perfect. And in this space, there's a lot of change and movement and iteration. So even if it's not perfect, it's good to start playing around with these things now as they'll become more and more a part of our worlds in the coming six, 12, 18 months. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, and we do have questions, but we decided we're gonna um, do all of those at the end. So keep your questions coming, we will be addressing them. And Katja, we're gonna send it now to you. Okay, <clears throat> oops. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how you actually test an application that uses machine learning or uses AI. Because whenever I talk to anybody about testing AI applications, they make funny faces and go like, yeah, right. That's how do you even test something when you don't even know what the answer is going to be? So then I'm going to talk a little bit about how it's not quite magic. There are quite a few things you can do to actually make sure that whatever your machine learning or AI program spits out is actually the thing you're after, right? Next slide, please. So yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why it isn't magic, or I already mentioned that a bit. Um, I talk about what the consideration for your data is because really the most important thing for testing machine learning and AI starts before you even start building, starts before you even touch your first bit of data. The considerations of how you build your model, how you set your model up in a testable way. There are things you can do with your CI and CD pipeline that make sure that you can, that everything is as well tested as it can be. And then there will be a little bit of summary. Next slide, please. So often people think this whole AI machine learning application is a bit of a black box, right? You throw data in one end or you throw a question in on one end and then you get an answer out at the other end. As we have seen, it is not quite like that. So there are many, many little moving parts in between that, that they are created by humans. So they can be understood by humans. Often these things are very complicated systems, but they are not complex systems. They are not systems that are not understandable. They are understandable systems. And even if you don't maybe understand the entirety of the system, you will definitely be able to understand a part of it and you will be able to question parts of it. And that is probably the most important thing for testers. People tend to think there is no clear expected outcome, but that is not true. We have a clear expected outcome. We may not know the exact wording of the answer we are getting out of there. We may not know the exact details of what we are getting as the outcome of a machine learning application, but we can tell we want it to be something like this. So when you start with your data modeling, you will have a training set, you will have a verification set, you will know what these data sets look like, and you can compare one against the other. That is how you test things, right? And yes, so AP mentioned that a little bit. People tend to think, oh, this newfangled new technology. Well, actually, it is not that new. People have been working with this for quite a long time. So there is a lot known about this. We only now have entered a time where we really have the computing power to use this efficiently. But the theories behind that are quite well understood, really. Next slide, please. So when you start building your model, really, really before you start to build anything, you need to think about your data because really machine learning and AI is all about data. The data you need to you need the provenance of you need to know the provenance of your test data. Where is your data coming from? What is the quality of this data? Is this data in a state that you can just use it? Will your data actually need interference? Will it need being prepared by human beings? And I apologize. My working from home situation involves two cats, which may start fighting on my desk in a moment. So if that happens, I'm really sorry. Um, data changes. So how, how often will you need to update your data set? 
there are some data sets where you just feed in your data set once and then you can use that for a good long time and there are other data sets which change frequently. So you need to think about that and how, how do you support these updates of data sets. Every time you need to update your data set, you will again, you need to split your data set into your test sets, into your verification set, into your training sets. Can, can that be automated? Or is this something that will require a lot of manual involvement in labor? How do you split your data sets? Do you have enough data to do this efficiently? Sorry. Um, and is your data set free of bias? Or do you know about the bias in your data set? Some data sets, you may want a certain bias but you need to think about what the quality of this data is. And next, next slide please. And then once you have settled on specifics for your data set, you can think about your model. How do you construct your model? What's the architecture of your model going to be like? Is it just one algorithm that you use or do you have an assembling approach? Do you have multiple algorithms that the data needs to feed through? How do, you, how do you make sure that these ensembles work together, that they actually work in the correct order, that they, they, they communicate with each other in the way you need them to communicate? Is your model even explainable? Can you explain what your model is going to do? In very simple words. Are there regulatory requirements that your model needs to fulfill. So as I mentioned in my introduction, we work quite a lot around healthcare data that is highly sensitive data. So how, how do you work with that? How do you make sure that none of your data gets leaked in the wrong, in the wrong way, that it doesn't get applied in wrong ways? Is there an ethics consideration behind that when, in what data you use and how you use it? And again, is your model biased in how it chooses or how it processes your data? The next slide, please. So once you have all of these set up, you're up and away and you're running, right? Well, there is more to do even. Next slide. So you are, you're happily developing and then you can build in testing into your development process after you have done all of your data modeling, all of your model considerations. Make sure that you have many, many unit tests. Test every piece of algorithm on its own and make sure that that does the right thing. So I'm going to speed through this a little bit because I don't want to get too bogged down in technical details here. I think what I really, the point I want to make is there are many, many technical details that we can look at in, in isolation and then as a whole thing to make sure that every aspect of models or model application and AI application is being tested. So there are, you can talk about training convergence, there are debuggers, there are ten, there's TensorFlow that you can use, there are tensor values you can look at. You can look at that particular components in your in your pipeline, build the expected artifacts. That's the integration between your pipeline components. Next slide. And then of course, you need to deploy and run this whole artificial intelligence somewhere, right? So you need to look uh, the compatibility with your target infrastructure. Is, your, is the infrastructure that is going to run your application able to support what you want? Is it able to support the th uh, through flow of data, the throughput of data? Is it able to support the incoming requests? You can, you can do, so the requests will be communicating with your application, generally speaking, through an API. So that can be tested in the, much the same way many, many normal APIs can be tested. You can do API contract tests, for example, to make sure that the requests are being handled in the right way, that your API can handle slightly abnormal requests coming in. Again, you can do data validation in there. You can do some performance tests and make sure that the speed of your application is as you expect. 
there can be predictive performance targets against which you can test. And then, of course, you should have really an automated pipeline, which means that every time you do an update to any part of your test, you have an automated deployment into different environments where then further tests can be run, whether those be automated as part of your deployment process or whether you have testers that then look at your deployed models and manually test against those models. Next slide. So again, I've chosen this, so, and I don't know if, how, if everybody knows this movie. I have taken my screenshots on. This is Fantasia by, by Disney, which arguably is probably the greatest Disney movie ever produced, I think. It is based on music that was written to, a co to basically uh, make audible a very old poem, from, um, which talks about the, apprentice, uh, the wizard's apprentice. And the wizard's apprentice is this figure. The wizard is gone, has gone away and the apprentice tries to wield the magic that he has seen the wizard wield, right? And he doesn't do things through very well, so things go horribly wrong because all of this magic that he has now unleashed suddenly develops its own life. And this is what we're trying to avoid. That, that's why I kind of keep harping on the point about think about what you do before you do it. Think about the outcome of your data predictive models. Think about the data you feed in there and how that influences the outcome you have. Think about how you manage this data, how you can update the data, how you can make sure that your data stays fresh so that you don't end up like the poor little apprentice's wizard who almost drowns before everything. However, in the end, it ends well. Next slide. So this is Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who, who is the author of the poem that this whole thing is based on. Ich rief als Geister, werd ich nun nicht los. This is the cry of the apprentice at the point in time where everything has gone out of, run out of control and he tries to get rid of the things that he has invoked just before he gets. So again, just as a little bit of warning. Don't be like that. Think about what you do before you do it. Thank you. Um, amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, it's just been so uh, educational, even for myself, and I know all three of you, to be going through this webinar together and each of us building on uh, each other's uh, knowledge. And so I'm going to be talking specifically about why diversity in AI matters and why we need new data sets. So uh, AP, Katja, and Jennifer all talked about it all starts with data right? Where is your data coming from? So my company, iVow AI, is an early stage startup bringing cultural intelligence to the global marketplace. So what does that mean? What that means is that if you pause for a moment and look at the most prominent um, algorithms like Word2Vec that was created by Google or other algorithms that are able to search and, and uh, give us understandings between relationships between words or semantics, uh, they still, to a certain extent, are uh, lacking some cultural intelligence. So AP and I, for the previous um, seminar that we had last month, we actually did a demo where we went into word to vec and we were able to put in a very famous Hindu goddess, the name of a very famous Hindu goddess, and this uh, algorithm, of course, didn't understand it or recognize it. And so our mission at IVAL is really... Um, bringing uh, cultural intelligence to the global marketplace. Our founders are come from NPR News and have experience engaging with NASA. Um, so what does that mean? That means that our culture graph, which is the nucleus of our technology, is in real time a repository of contemporary cultures and subcultures based on these different uh, categories. So uh, holidays, festivals, sports, music, arts, food. Uh, the idea that uh, we are understanding consumer audiences and identifying them and graphing them in a data mining exercise which analyzes th th three terabytes of public media per day, understanding where cultural segments, subcultures are around the world based on whether it's based on zip code or um, regional. And so this obviously in the future can drive advertising spend um, and hyperlocal targeting in completely new ways. 
Um, so our culture graph makes data culturally relevant. But as everyone uh, on this um, webinar has said, we don't have enough cultural data. So guess what? We can use Google API. We, we are gonna be using Google News uh, machine learning uh, algorithm because they have 3 million pieces of data and something like 80 billion uh, you know, pieces of data in addition to the 3 million news items they have. But will they be able to tell me about a Samoan goddess? Will they be able to tell me about the Hindu goddess? AP, what is the name of the Hindu goddess? I have to honor her. You're on mute. Yes, the, the, the one that we searched is not a goddess, actually. She's a very prominent figure in Hinduism. Feminist. Her name is Draupadi. Okay, she's a pet feminist, sorry. Pioneering feminist. Super cool, super cool super, female. Super cool woman. Okay, so that's why we, in conjunction with building our um, culture graph, we are also creating crowdsourcing new data. And the first one we're working on is stories on women because we need to bring new data to introduce to our own training model. Our own training model needs to have more diverse data. So uh, currently we're in a crowdfunding um, mode where we're still building um, the challenge and we're looking to uh, announce this challenge at the AI for Good Summit in September, 2020. Uh, we were gonna be doing it in May, but that got pushed back. And that's where we're going to be doing also a demo um, using some of the current major algorithm models that you all know of that Google has put out, et cetera, and showing their vulnerabilities, showing that testers for the most part, and I have been very honored to be part of your community for the past two years. I've attended many different uh, testing conferences. And the reason why is because I believe passionately that you are the front lines of making sure that AI is going to be culturally relevant because you come all from different backgrounds. And so uh, how is it that we can create an algorithm that'll generate a character profile when the name of a prominent female in history is inputted and also uh, include informative captions fewer than 100 words. These new data sources will be put on something called AI Commons and AI Commons is a nonprofit organization that's been brought together by XPRIZE, uh, data scientists from Berkeley, Stanford, uh, Uber, many, many different organizations, IBM are all part of AI Commons, AP and I are community members of AI Commons, and what we generate, all of the methodology will go directly onto AI Commons as a learning um, uh, place, similar to like Wikipedia, so that any of you in the future can also grab that algorithm and use it for testing future uh, products and solutions. Um, and so really where we're at is we're looking for uh, ambassadors to join us, to uh, help us spread the news about why we need new data sets to help make the future of AI solutions products more diverse. And um, as I mentioned, we're gonna be presenting this at the AI for Good Summit in September. And uh, before we go to your questions, I want to do a big shout out uh, to um, AP, to Kashif Morali, Testmaster Academy, Anna, uh, to AI Commons, to Jennifer from PinkLion.ai, to Contra Digital Services, Coach Kathy Kemper and Lale Bakhtiar, who are uh, the founding ambassadors who are really helping us share this news about why, especially now, in a moment that social distancing has become the norm because of the global pandemic to understand why it's so important for us to create products and solutions that are more culturally inclusive, that'll bring us together, help us understand each other more, help us see the patterns around our cultures, that during the spring, the Persian New Year or Nowruz isn't the only festival that perhaps like showcases eggs. Easter does it. Many other cultural expressions use the same kinds of festivals to come together around unity, around family and community. And the future of AI will reflect these cultures because people like Jennifer, people like Katja, people like AP, Anna, and myself are gonna work hard to make sure that happens. So 
we're going to go next to your questions and AP do you mind um, going through them one by one and we have about uh, 15 minutes so that's good we have time to yeah do this. yeah we have enough time I think some of this got covered but I'll still uh, go through the question so the first question is uh, Trish is asking how to figure out the test data anyone want to take that on the panel yeah, I'm very briefly, I'm just going to say in our context, I mentioned to you what our test data is going to be. We're going to use the Google News Machine Learning Library because of the fact that it has so many pieces of information in it already. And so there are many different libraries that you can turn to for test data, but let me have uh, Katya and Jennifer also respond to that. I think Kasha had an entire slide yes. on thinking about data. <laughs> okay, I go next. <laughs> I was waiting for Jennifer if she wanted to say anything. Anyways, yeah, so test data is an interesting one. I mean, your test data is also, well, your test data generally comes from the same set your training data comes from, right? You take a bit data set and then you split that into different groups and use part one of your group for training, one of your part group for verification. Yeah, and the to general, point out, uh, what's the word? Sorry, I forgot the word. Validation data set. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So, um, quite and quite often, that is a significant amount of work to prepare this data. This data, you you know, you can't quite often you can't just take a bunch of data and use that. You need to have a human that goes through and tags the data so that it actually becomes digestible to your algorithm. Cool. Thank cool. you. Yeah. How do you define strategies for AI projects? This is also from, I'm actually not going to take this question because I think entire talk from Kasha was basically on this. How do you strategize AI projects? So I think you got a pretty good sense of that. Um, we have what and how do work, how do you work on sentiment analysis? I think this is for Jennifer. Yes, I was going to say, so a couple of things, it's all about for in a lot of organizations, what they're looking to do is go across anywhere where someone writes a review. So that could be on um, public review sites, it could be the app stores, either Apple, Google, app stores, yeah. compiling because it's large amounts of data. So in companies, a lot of times to compile all that data, have a human look through it takes a week or two or more, depending on how, the volume of the data, and then they have to categorize and correlate all of it. So what you can do is use AI to go out and grab automatically those scores, those reviews from all of those various sites. You tell it which ones you want it to go to, where you want to pull from that are publicly available, bring that data back, and then categorize and group it into logical groupings that make sense in your organization. And then really the humans are still required though, they go through and make sure that it was grouped correctly, that those things made sense, that there wasn't a mistrain on some of the correlated information inside of it. Good, sorry, I just wanted to make a clarification. I misspoke when the question was, what is test data? I was talking about training data, I apologize. So when I talked about Google News Machine Learning Library, that's where we're getting our training data. And so then Katja spoke about the test data. Thank you. Yeah, we've had previous webinars. So the, I think two webinars back, we had an entire webinar just talking about data sets. I know Anna is working on getting those on like uh, YouTube's uh, watch out for those announcements from Test Matters Masters Academy. Okay, so we have, what do you think of AI automation? will only be an addition to existing traditional automation, but not a total replacement. I let Jennifer take this, I've answered this question enough. <laughs> so yeah, and, and what I was trying to say is I think like with many things, it's an additional tool or option for us in the toolkit. So in our professions, we have many different things we can leverage and use, and it's about knowing when it's appropriate to use what tool and what makes sense. So in some cases, AI automation makes sense and leveraging machine learning algorithms to be your virtual research assistant. But there's cases where it's not as efficient and actually using 
a traditional Selenium, Appium, one of the other tools that's available is more appropriate. So I think for us in our profession, it's about being educated about what the tools are that are out there, which ones make sense in which scenarios and getting help um, if, you, if you don't understand. And we do um, a comparative sheet of different tools in the market space. So if people are interested in that, we could post that out for people. It's just a look across all the different um, tools that are out there in testing and where they play, what they're applicable for. And then you can obviously do your own homework and research, but it's a starting point. Okay, so we have, is it good to have bias in test data or no? And how do you define bias in test data? Well, as I know that I touched upon this. So bias in test data is really, really, really an interesting one because the bias is not necessarily in the data. The bias may also come out of your data set, right? So if you have a data set like, like the, the one that um, the VAR mentioned, where it just has, doesn't, where your data just does not have knowledge about per certain things, then that creates a bias towards the things it knows about and against the things it doesn't know about. There is a fairly um, famous example about Amazon who basically wrote what is the holy grail of machine learning applications, namely a tool that sifts through CV applications. And that was heavily biased against women because they trained it on the data of successful applications, which at that point in time happened to be 93% male. So the, so the machine learning algorithm would sort out everything that mentioned female chess clubs, female golf clubs, female whatever, right? So those are the things we're looking for when we're talking about data or bias in data or bias created by data. Um, can, I, can I add to that? I think it goes back to your basic testing principles of what is your application actually trying to do? Right. So in some situations, if your application is, say, for example, if you're looking at um, something that only impacts males, I'm just saying, right, or only impacts children, like if it, this is something being developed for like pediatricians, do you really want to train it on a 60 year old female or a 30 year old female? You don't. You want that bias or you want to have data that is inclusive of children. So it really depends what your application is doing. Um, and that is more of a testing fundamental principle or software development fundamental principle than like AI or ML. Okay, how do you measure the output? I don't necessarily understand that question. Um, is it, I, I think they're trying to ask if the output is not known as like a requirement where like one goes to two or something like that. Is, is that what the question, I think, uh, Kasha spoke about this very nicely where she said that it was, it's really, you. it's not that you don't know the outcome, it is, is what is it that is expected out of the outcome? Did I, did I say that correctly, Kasha? I actually like yeah. that phrase quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the point I was trying to make. So whilst you may not know the exact, the exact details of your outcome, you do know what outcome you're looking for. So it's right. not, not unknown. Okay, so the last question I have is AI automation applicable for API automation also, or is it only for UI automation? Jennifer, would you like to take that? Sure. Or Kasha? Yeah, there is tools out there that do um, both. There are more tools that I have personally seen and interacted with that focus on the UI. Um, just due to the nature of um, some of the technology companies that are out there that have had a focus primarily on UI automation, both for mobile and web. Um, so there's more of them, but there are definitely tools out there that do work for the API layer. Um, it's a matter of identifying if that's more efficient a tool for you than your current API automation that you have, I think is the question. Whereas um, the UI layer, there are some tools out there that don't hook into the DOM. So when the code changes or the DOM changes, what's more efficient about using AI for your UI layer is you can have repeated changes. You could even completely rewrite the back end 
and of your system, say to go from Java to JavaScript or from Java to Python, and your AI on the front end isn't looking at that, so it won't need to completely be redone when you redo the back end coding language or make some significant changes. So that's why um, the UI layer has been more focused on, in my opinion, by tooling companies and technology companies than the API layer. But I have seen tools out there like Ready API and some others that do APIs as well. Tasha, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I, I think that pretty much covers what I would have to say about this. Cool. Uh, we don't have any more questions. Yeah. So maybe just in the last couple minutes, I, I just uh, wanted us to go around and um, talk about what empowers us or inspires us in this field. So what keeps you up at night, excites you about what you're doing? Uh, we currently have uh, Jennifer, again, for those of you who might have joined late uh, from pinklion.ai, who is in Minnesota. Um, her company is a Google Gradient Ventures backed uh, startup. Um, we have Katja Obring from Infinity Works, who is joining us from Leeds, United Kingdom. And we have uh, Aprajita Mathur of Garden Health joining us from the Bay Area. Uh, I'm Devar Ardalan from IVAO AI in the Washington, D.C. area. And I'll just uh, start by saying that what keeps me up at night is that I'm really excited. I, I started as a public media broadcaster journalist at National Public Radio at the age of 29. As I looked at the future of storytelling, even in the field of public broadcasting, many uh, voices are still missing. Um, if you hear public radio, you'll know that it is very much, you know, a certain group of people who um, uh, we hear from all the time. In fact, NPR just did a survey in the last three months showing why they need to diversify even the voices of national public radio. This isn't something that is only a problem in you know, the future of AI. It's something that we need to make better in the future. And that's what I am excited about is using AI as a tool to uh, mark uh, new cultures, new subcultures, and be able to help represent uh, better stories and better products and solutions in the future. And I will throw it to Jennifer next. Yeah, that was brilliant, Tavar. And that's something that you and I align so closely on and why we're such a big supporter of um, what you're doing at IVAO and with the data set challenges, because um, as Katia said really beautifully um, when she talked about, it begins in the beginning. And the bias begins in the beginning when you're starting to create something. So when we have more diverse voices, as Devar says, as we build this next generation of technology, when those voices are diverse, when we create products that, are, that have a diverse team that's involved in them, you create a better product from the beginning. And we have an opportunity in this fourth industrial revolution, they're calling it, and in this wave, to dramatically change the landscape and have a landscape that reflects more of the people that are actually using these products and building these products instead of building things just with a very narrow set of individuals and voices and people. So I get excited that you look at this panel and we have a very diverse group of people from where we're sitting in the world or in the country, um, where we come from in our backgrounds. That gives me hope. Um, and then we're also hopeful at Pink Lion, we're engaging the youth in AI because we think diversity in age and gender and all different types of diversity is important. So we're also engaged right now in a hackathon for kids um, around AI so that they can create AI solutions and social media solutions that promote and encourage kindness and empathy in the world um, instead of some of the things we are seeing, like the bullying and, and other problems we're seeing for kids today. Thank you so much. And a couple minutes left, so Katja, you have a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be fast. It's fairly, fairly easy, really. Um, so what is, excites me about this is that I think we are on the brink of being able to take a lot away a lot of tedious, repetitive work from people, which will then free them up to think beautiful thoughts and do beautiful things. And I think that is what excites me. Amazing. AP. So you and Jennifer kind of said it, I've been in the medical field for as long as I remember. And I have seen this so many times where 
not having diverse data sets, even though we're all humans and our genetic code is very similar, just very small changes in our genetic code make us very, very different. That is just one aspect of what makes us different outside of everything else. Humans are complex and um, the medical field um, can use more diverse data sets. And I, I remember hearing you last year in June and when you were talking about this in women data sets, I was like, oh my God, someone's actually doing something about it. Even though it's not in medical sciences, this is still great. We're thinking about this stuff. This is awesome. So yes, I, that is what keeps me excited. Um, and I'm hoping that with Gardent and companies like Gardent, we can do better with our patients. We can bring better outcomes to them. Incredible. So I know that Anna joins me in thanking all the panelists for this extraordinary hour that has been incredibly uh, educational. And uh, we are grateful to all of the audience who joined us as well. And um, we'll share um, uh, news once the voice, um, the recording is available for you to be able to share widely. Thank you so much for joining us and hope everybody stays safe and healthy. Thank you.